uh, TED later than uh, the program suggests. We're just waiting for uh, more people to come in, and as soon as they are in, we should start. Just give us plus minus 10 minutes, and then we will start with the program. Thank you.
um, start with the program of the day. <coughs> um, just to first introduce myself, uh, my name is uh, Matuhu Thomas uh, Morale. I am the uh, Executive Dean of the College of Economic and Management Sciences in the University of South Africa. I have been uh, uh, given the honor to facilitate today's proceedings um, in this uh, 13th Eskiam Patlele annual memorial lecture. <coughs> Good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Um, those who are here in this uh, uh, beautiful venue, um, as well as those who are watching the proceedings of this lecture um, through YouTube. And uh, we just would like, uh, on behalf of uh, University of South Africa Management, to welcome you and, uh, um, and wish that you sit back and relax. Um, members of uh, uh, University Council, the Chair of Council with us here today, Mr. Mavua, the members of Senate, family of, the, of Professor Eskia Mpathele here with us, professors in UNISA, lecturers, researchers, and students. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, UNISA 13th Eskia Mpathele Memorial Annual Lecture. Through this lecture, we pay tribute and celebrate the memory of an icon, an author, an activist, and may I say, a philosopher. This year marks the 14th anniversary of the death of the renowned educationist who is a father of modern African literature. In commemoration of this icon, who worked tirelessly towards betterment of African education and achieved so much and contributed to the realization of goals of our democracy, we invited Professor I.T. Musala to deliver today's lecture. Professor Musala's credentials are well known, and I'll leave it to those who know him better to introduce him later. Suffice to say, like all the previous speakers before him, we can brace ourselves for a mouth-watering lecture as well as a thought-provoking presentation of ideas. It's all thanks to UNISA's role since its founding, which is best summed up in its mission and vision of being a comprehensive, open distance learning institution that produces excellent scholarship and research. Rooted in its history and connection to the modern societal environment, UNISA has as its mission to provide knowledge and to supporting students so that they become the best they are capable of becoming. Just a few remarks for this function today to keep us comfortable and undisturbed. May I request that we all mute our cell phones. Um, if it is those old cell phones that don't get muted easily, remove the battery. We will also be requesting that there be minimum walk-ins and walk-out so that our speakers are allowed to concentrate on their presentations. I just would also like to advise that uh, those of you who are pressed by forces of nature and would like to go to the loo, you, the exit on my left here, um, you walk out, the first would be ladies' toilet, 
and the next one would be for gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, let us sit, relax, and enjoy today's public lecture. I'm now going to ask Professor Mulogu Seputa, the acting deputy registrar, student administration and support services at UNISA to provide us with some introductory remarks. Thank you, Program Director, Professor Mohali. I would like to extend my sincere greetings to our Principal and Vice Chancellor, Professor Julian Lengabula, who will come and welcome us shortly. Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, protocol observed, very good evening to you all. I want to say to you, the Northeastern region is really honored to play host for this important gathering, the 13th Eskia Annual Memorial Lecture. Due to COVID-19, our 11th lecture, which was in 2020, was delivered fully online. That is why most of you wouldn't be here with us. And uh, our 12th lecture in 2021 was delivered through the hybrid mode. And uh, the, 13th the 13th annual follows the same pattern. It is our wish that uh, the 14th one that I can assure you is coming will be face to face and then things will go back to normal. We'll speak about no more new normal, but about the normal. Madam VC, we are grateful that this lecture is hosted again in Pulukwane to honor Professor Mpatele in his own death. We believe that is a befitting honor to Prof Mpatele, as this is an indication that Professor Mpatele was and continues to be a special man. He is one of the few prophets that are actually honored in their hometowns. You are all aware that uh, prophets are hardly appreciated in their birthplaces. Professor Mpatele's loyal student and follower, program director, don't fight with me, Lesecha Ramukolo, contends that it is wrong to call a skier an icon or religion because he is not. He contends that Professor Mpatele is the presence. He is here with us. Even though he was called to eternal rest almost or over a decade ago, Professor Mpatele continues to be with us. He continues to bring us together. That's why every year we meet here to come and honor and uh, celebrate his activities. He continues to educate us. Through his life and works, we are constantly reminded that we are totally submerged within African humanism. And unlike Western culture, which was brought into African communities and which actually promotes individualism and selfishness, African, Afri African humanism, it's us, it's within us, we are completely submerged in it. The individualness and selfishness that we talked about that is associated with Western culture are two aspects that are far from Professor Mpatele. Ramukolu sees him as a prophet who strengthens our cultural immune system through his works. And he does that to connect us with ourselves. 
Professor Mpatele's life and work speak volumes to his audience. His life reveals a man who refused to suffer in silence. A man who always chose to listen to his mind and not his heart when taking decisions. A man who refused to outsource his thinking as this seems to be the common trend today in a world where the line between good and bad is very bled. Mukhara Kwamakubela becomes very brutal about Africans and their character. In his Educating the Imagination, he aversed that we are carriers of disinherited minds. A careful analysis of our situation reveals that we are certainly deprived of our heritage. Reflecting on his early years in Maupaning, he imagines the plowing time, he imagines the first spring rains, he imagines the time of harvesting, and of course, many others. He goes on to indicate that those things are no more. Today there's no land. Today there's no harvesting. And for him, what is even more sad is that even if we were to be given our land back, we don't have the skill to use that land. And that explains why our Zebedeela trust, trust is where it is today. That explains why our Zanin tree transpiration is where it is today. As a prophet, Mpatele's work poses crucial and pertinent questions to us. One asks the following questions. We no longer have skills to plow. Do we have the skills to transform our education system? Do we have the skills to transform our judicial system? Do we have the skills to resuscitate our collapsing economy? Do we have the skill to stop the rapidly growing moral decay of our time? Mpatela spent his time for fighting for the re-inheritance of what is rightfully us. And if we are to honor him in the true sense of the word, we have to continue where he stopped. Unfortunately, it looks like we are going towards the opposite direction, far away from Patel's African humanism. We are mainly associated with individualism and selfishness. And that explains the maladministration and corruption that we always talk about amongst ourselves. We continue to outsource our thinking we consistently fail to stop unpardonable ongoing atrocities we are faced with daily. How do we even explain a situation where our precious teenagers spend most of their time swimming in alcohol, perishing in taverns, when they should actually be studying? How do we start to explain the common criminal cases that we hear about on a daily basis, there are always murder cases reported. There are always rape cases facing us daily. Think of the Kruger Stop gang rape. Think of the funeral parlor gang rape in our province and many others to mention but a few. All these acts are truly un-African, inhuman, and far from what Mpatele believed in. We are here as his scholars. We are here as his, as his students. We are here to honor him. The best we can do is try to do what he spent his life fighting for. He fight against this and uh, his values and moral philosophy might help us to address the current challenges we face. Ladies and gentlemen, we are having, as uh, our program director indicated today, uh, one of our keynote speakers who will be addressing us on the missing variable and the wrong data set, Eskiam Patel, the intellectual. 
This for me, ladies and gentlemen, is a captivating topic and sounds to be interdisciplinary in nature. So we are all covered today. And we are looking forward to the presentation. I thank you, Program Director, and uh, please enjoy the lecture and the debates. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, thought-provoking preface um, statement. Indeed, you've left us with a number of questions that are piercing through our souls, and we, asked, we are left asking the question, what do we take forward from where Professor Eskian Pasele has left off? Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, we were expecting to have a poem by Ms. Chofa Chomunama. And uh, I've just been informed that uh, whilst driving to this venue, she was involved in an accident. She is in hospital. And so we wish her a speedy recovery. So, um, we will just uh, have to skip that particular item and then proceed to the next item on the agenda, which is the multimedia presentation, UNISA Research DVD. For over a century, UNISA has evolved to become a world-class center for African research and innovation, shaping futures in the service of humanity and seeking answers to our continent's educational and developmental challenges. Technology allows us to have visibility and to increase access to medicine. The No Paraffin campaign is directed at energy poverty, Visual methodologies offer a vocabulary to often unspeakable experiences of trauma. We have a pipeline of anti-cancer drugs that we have developed and that we are studying. Through the work of its academic community, both on its campuses and further afield, UNISA has built a trusted reputation as a leading brand for research on the continent innovating approaches to African challenges and contributing to the global canon of knowledge. I'm Ashley van Niekerk. I have a PhD in social medicine. My research has focused on burn injury. Burns are extremely painful and traumatic. In South Africa, we report about 100,000 such injuries a year with paraffin heavily implicated in these, as well as other health outcomes. The No Paraffin campaign seeks a transition to safe and modern energy for energy impoverished communities. It does this by phasing out domestic paraffin use and by fast-tracking implementation of safe alternatives. Thus far, we are reviewing paraffin stove standards, and secondly, applying for a butterant to be added to paraffin to reduce poisoning while preparing for a national information campaign to inform the energy migration. UNISA has created a multidisciplinary platform to focus on energy, which is a, a pivotal and leading concern for this decade. My name is Masham Kansi. I am a professor at the College of Economic and Management Sciences. When I was growing up, I was always caught up in between the summer heat of the Lipompo region and the whining sound of mosquitoes. Each time I tried to cover up, it felt like a furnace. And when I opened up, it was a risk of catching malaria. 
So when I encountered that one of the challenges for eradicating the impact that malaria has is the supply chain problem, I felt compelled to deploy some of my supply chain principles in developing an application that is affordable and will enable different stakeholders in the supply chain to react to the issue of malaria. Following the pilot studies is the commercialization of the application and making sure that for those that cannot afford, we are able to improve healthcare and those that can afford, we are able to commercialize the application for sustainability and for job creation. UNISA has allowed me to travel internationally and showcase some of the best research that we produce in the University of South Africa, but also to use that research to have uh, impact in our community. My name is Puleng Sakhalo. I'm a professor of psychology in the College of Human Sciences here at UNISA. Embroidery offers the opportunity for people to express what they often would not be able to express in words. South Africa has one of the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world. So the idea is that through these visual narratives, we are able to engage with how it affects not only those who the violence is perpetrated against, but also those who perpetrate the violence. It's a way for us to look at the work of art and feel challenged to take action. UNISA puts forward engaged scholarship and it forces us and gives us the opportunity to think about our work not limited within university walls, but to think about how we can collaborate and work with and alongside our communities. Fruit flies are a very good model for the study of many diseases, especially cancer. I am Mon Dendwasa, professor of biochemistry, but also specialize in innate immunology. Well, cancer is a very important disease burden throughout the world. Although the traditional methods for treating cancer have advanced over the years, the survival of cancer patients and the recurrence of cancer cases has not been improved. So the work on fruit flies started when we were looking at the effects of chemotherapy on fruit flies. That led to the discovery of one of, of the drugs that we are working with now. One of these drugs is now in, in preclinical development. If we are able to get into uh, clinical stages, our molecule will be the second small molecule in the continent to reach that, such a stage. So it's, a, it's an important psychological milestone as well. UNISA's research and innovation community is meeting challenges with an approach to how knowledge should be produced. This multidisciplinary collaborative approach is creating African solutions to African problems. This commitment to cutting-edge, impactful research saw UNISA honored as the recipient of the Excellence for Research Impact category at the Zaidi International Awards for Excellence in Higher Education. Research is no longer just for curiosity. Research is really geared at innovation. Research offers us the opportunity to think about and do work that has the potential to bring about change in society. It gives us the power to go beyond publication to improving the situations on the ground. Multidisciplinary research provides an important platform to reduce social and other inequalities. We get to explore, we get to understand, we get to discover some of the ways in which we can respond to and come up with solutions to the problems that are facing our world, the globe and the universe more broadly. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, DVD and uh, 
Um, these are but just a few of the researchers that UNISA boasts. Um, and there are others who are doing real innovative uh, studies and research um, who we couldn't accommodate in that particular video. So um, we're really uh, thankful uh, for, the, for the video indeed. Um, and that, I think, was an introductory uh, statement as well um, to bring up and welcome uh, the Vice Chancellor um, to introduce our guest speaker. Professor Lengavula, um, the floor is yours. Favela, <laughs> Dumelang, San Bonan. I thought uh, Professor Mohal would have told us about his clan name. He only introduced, because he comes from this region, he only introduced himself. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you a little bit about mine, but before I do so, let me acknowledge uh, Professor Mohali, the Executive Dean of the College of Economic Sciences and Management, uh, Economic and Management Sciences at UNISA. Let me also recognize the presence of the Council Chair, Mr. James Mashukudu Mabua, who's also, you can already imagine, from this region, and members of Council present here tonight but also members of council participating through the virtual platform. Let me take also the opportunity to recognize the management committee of the University of South Africa present here, Professor Meiwa, Professor Mutata. I'm not aware of any other member of Mencom who is here that I might not have recognized. I also see that the deans, the regional directors, and all senior professors at UNISA, as well as the students are here. Let me recognize deans, deputy deans at the university. Our honored lecturer tonight, Professor Itumeleng Musala, who's the executive director of Steel Nation Venture. He's a published author, a social commentator, an editor, renowned speaker, mentor to many scholars, leaders in the country and globally, but also one who is known to many of us as the Secretary of the Judicial Commun Commission on the Enquiry into State Capture. <coughs> Let me also recognize uh, Professor Muluko Seputa, the Acting Deputy Registrar, who's our host uh, alongside with Dr. Muluko. Then in the program, we are going to be having a Mekosukhadi Moramedi Motapo, who's an admitted attorney of the High Court of South Africa and a member of parliament, the director and founder of Mar Muremadi Motapo Foundation. Professor Grace Kunong, acting as the director in institutional advancement, but also the leading feminist academic in the country on issues of sociology and the scholarship of black women in South Africa and in the world, Ms. Sukhofazo Munama, who is not able to be with us as Professor Mukhali has already stated, Dr. Komani Mpashele and other members of the Mpashele family in attendance here tonight. Representatives from provincial government, local government, representatives of various political parties, uh, Dr. Musimbudi Mangena, representing uh, the fraternity of political party leaders, but also the stalwarts in the fight for the freedom and liberation of South Africa. Government, repre uh, business community, the legal fraternity, civil society, sister institutions of higher education, the Chamber of Commerce in Limpopo, university staff, students, workers, convocation, 
other honored representatives, including the youngest members of participants tonight. So please don't, uh, I can see you're, you're, you're uncomfortable. No, we embrace uh, that uh, music. It's part of who we are as society. So don't worry, she's welcome. Distinguished representatives of the University of South Africa, esteemed guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I, I, Professor Muhali said I'm going to be introducing the speaker. I wasn't given that mandate. <laughs> I was given a different mandate, but I'll do both. I, I was asked to really express our welcome to you, to this august event, the 13th annual Eski Ampashele Memorial Lecture, in this sprawling and yet harmonious Pulukwan, where the roots of our scholar are icon, one referred to as the prophet, Professor Eski Ampashele, is rooted. The life and times of this African literary giant and the intellectual legacy that he has left for all of us, from writers, budding scholars, as well as knowledge production, communities or agents, including academics, find in Dade Eskiam Pahlele a fountain of knowledge from whence to really ignite our collective commitments to ensuring that knowledge is not just limited to the ivory towers of universities, but is transformed, transferred, and negotiated and lived out in communities. It is through memorial lectures such as this, which are part of our engaged scholarship, our research program, where we engage various knowledge community here at home and abroad to reimagine knowledge and help UNISA to remain true to the vision of being the African university shaping futures in the service of humanity. Colleagues have already shown you through the video some of the critical work that we do, whether on research on oncological issues or can cancer issues, the questions that Professor Sepota asks about land and how do we reinvest and reimagine our engagement with land, and fortunately, Professor Musala is one of those scholars for a very long time, prior to 1994, even post-1994, that has called to ask these questions of the land, how we engage with the land, as well as the contestations around the land. So I am quite excited because all the readings I had which were prescribed for me in my studies, I had to learn Professor Musala's works. But what is not often known of Professor Musala is the fact that he was one of the pioneers of higher education leadership in South Africa. The first to taste the contradictions of a transforming world where universities led by Africans had to negotiate themselves in the idea of Africanization of universities. And I think this is an area that finds resonance with the scholarship, but also the agitation by Professor Eskiam Pahlele to ensuring that we do not separate ourselves from the worlds of knowledge that must be the fountains of support and of knowledge systems in our country, in the continent, and in the global arena. In this era of amazing technological development, often, my, often marked by the compression of time and space, let me express my gratitude to the role that technology in its all forms play in weaving the entire human race together, irrespective of the physical distance from one another, as is the case with this memorial lecture. But we recognize as UNISA that in our country, there's also issues of media separation, media access, or even this technological access and the divide that we must work towards overcoming. And as we celebrate the ability to having this hybrid lecture that we are constantly aware and committed 
to overcoming these chasms that make it impossible for the academy to being accessible. From all walks of life and wherever you might be connected to this event, we feel gratified by each and everyone's presence as well as the endeavor to keep the flame that Ntate Eskiam Pathele burning advancement and development of human race in its diversity supported. We are delighted that Professor Itumeleng Musala has agreed to, to deliver the 13th Eskiam Pathele Memorial Lecture for 2022. I noticed that in the list that seeks to provide a brief biography of Professor Musala, a glaring omission is that of him as an exponent of black consciousness movement. As a fellow who was working as, as alongside and reimagining South Africa and its emancipatory trajectories alongside with Steve Biko, a fellow, a comrade who constantly in the writings, reflections with Steve Biko rode and bequeathed South Africa with a strong commitment through co strong commitment to the liberation motif, but also to addressing the land questions without any apology. He was also the former president of one of our liberation movements, the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Musala, that uh, you still weave your political agitation, your intellectual resources, your leadership as one of the key intellectuals of our times to ensure that the next generations of scholars, of students, of leaders, of political leaders continue with conscious decision around the human, the humor, as well as the honor of the life of times of Eskiam Pathele. And through an annual lecture series back in 2009, let me on behalf of all of us take this opportunity to acknowledge and recognize the ever-present family of Professor Mpathele. Your continuous support of this, our humble effort and honor, adds really immeasurable impetus to our desire and determination as the university to keeping the memory of Professor Eskiam Patele alive. We recognize that since his passing on the 27th October 2008, when this legendary figure lost his life near Libuahomu, here in his beloved Limpopo, that many thought his life would have been forgotten. It is really worthwhile that we celebrate not only his memory, but the body of literature, the works that he left behind, the political imagination of an Africa that's self-reliant, that trusts its knowledge systems, that invests in its futures. Ndate Mpatele fought for this alongside with scholars such as Professor Musala, who will be presenting. Professor Mpatele's autobiography and his prolific writings are a reflection of our country's stories from oppression to freedom. He left South Africa in the wake of treason trial in 1956 and spent 26 years in exile in Nigeria, Paris, and the United States. He came back to his motherland in the aftermath of June 1976, so were to uprisings. The preceding move enabled him to play the role in the heightened struggle of st political and intellectual liberation that became the foundation of the former freedom fighters. Mine, colleagues, is not to deliberate on his life and work that will be done by Professor Musala. I, however, say, as the university, family for sharing him with, with us and in the world of the spirit of Ubuntu or Botu, 
which we wrote about extensively. We wish you a generous and fantastic deliberations. It is my humble wish to you that you all enjoy this lecture, that we get the contested meanings of Professor Mpatele's contributions, and as well, Thank you, VC, for those uh, introductory remarks and words of uh, welcome. It is now my honor and pleasure to ask that we just uh, stand up and, and, and give Prof. Mosala a, a walk to the podium. Good evening, or is it good afternoon? Good evening. tend to keep my documents in this folder these days. <laughs> the folder is, um, or reads like this, Commission of Inquiry into State Capture. <laughs> okay. Inquiry into the allegations of state capture fraud and corruption in the public sector, including organs of state. I do, however, try not to make people uncomfortable by not assuring them that this is just a folder. <laughs> there is nothing else in it. <laughs> it's important to, to relax. If, um, if I haven't called you so far, <laughs> there is no chance <laughs> that you could be called by anybody. Thank you very much, Program Director. Let me start with the normal protocol. I always assume that even if the Chancellor is not here, the Chancellor is listening. So I will start with recognizing the Chancellor of the University of South Africa, His Excellency, the former President of the Republic, Mr. Thabo Mbuyelwa Mbeki. 
there is just a chance that he actually might be connecting virtually as well. The Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of South Africa, Professor Puleng Lengabula. The Acting Regional Director, UNISA Northeastern Region, Dr. Lisiba Mulepo. Chairperson of Council of the University of South Africa and members of Council, those who are here and those who might also be connecting from a distance. The family of Prof. Eskiam Pathele, colleagues, students, workers of the university, special guests, Ladies and gentlemen, sons and daughters of the soil, I greet you this afternoon and I would like to just say that I am extremely honored to deliver this lecture this afternoon. Can I ask for some water, please? It is a privilege. It is indeed a privilege to be here this afternoon for many reasons. More importantly, I had the privilege of um, meeting Prof when he returned to the country and doing some work with him at the time when he did some work uh, in Soweto and with a number of community organizations. I had the privilege in the 80s, I think it was, um, to work with him. Now I have a tendency of, um, of getting myself into trouble. One of the things with which I have done that today is this topic that I have decided to speak on, on this occasion. I was actually very pleased that, uh, there, were, that there are discussions with me today. I said to them when I got into the holding room that I hope they are going to help me find out what is it that I wanted to say. <laughs> In 1977, I arrived in Manchester, at the University of Manchester, to go and study. And down the road on Oxford Road, as you go towards the university, there is a little building which catches your attention if you are maybe like me and, and, uh, and others of you here. And the reason for that is that it's got a plaque that tells that that is where Frederick Engels, who was a very close friend of Karl Marx, used to work from. And next door to that building, there is a very small library, very old, small library selling old books. Well, I first stopped to just make sure that if Frederick, if it is true that the ancestors and God exist, that um, both God and the ancestors 
will recognize my respect for Frederick Engels and through him, his friend Karl Marx. I stopped for a very short time only and then I moved on and I stopped next door at the library. In there, I picked two books which I still have in my library. One of them was a book called um, Marxism and Religion. Another one was a book called Down Second Avenue. And I bought those two books. I was more comfortable with Down down, down Second Avenue than I was with um, Marxism and religion. I had gone there to study theology. I was highly Christian. I was very worried about the story of Marxism and religion. So I shelved that one and decided that I will read Down Second Avenue. I did not put it down. I read it until I was done with it. My wife was a young little girl. We were in our 20s at the time, uh, who came from the science background. So I asked her to please read it. And I should tell you, I'm glad she's not here today. I suspect she might be listening to me, though. But I hope not, because she refused to read it. <laughs> Another occasion, I'll tell you why. It had nothing to do with Prof. Eskiam Patlele. In fact, she didn't know who he was. I did. I never forgot that book. And so when the university asked me to come and deliver this lecture a few weeks ago, I went back to my library. I love my library. I love my books. I carry my books with me, as you can see. <laughs> but I thought to myself, if I, if I did not find that copy, I would have to go and buy it. Because it would be wrong for me to come and deliver this lecture without having gone back to reread the most powerful words, the most powerful story, the greatest insights by a great African intellectual. And it was quite clear to me that I actually want to talk about African intellectualism today. So originally, that was the theme. I was going to talk about African intellectuals and African intellectualism. Let me put it more clearly. Black intellectuals and black intellectualism. I try never to say both things, to forget to say both things. So I started rereading the book. I didn't read all of it this time. I tried to find Prof. Mpatlele in the book. I didn't have enough time. I thought if I tried to read it knowing myself, I would need a lot more time than I have to prepare for this lecture. So I kept finding things and places and I was looking for identity, and I was looking for, for thoughts. And I was looking for, for roots. And I was looking for a message. But like I, said, like I said to you, I have a tendency to get myself into trouble all the time. It's not only today, 
because of the topic, I will stick to the topic. I do want to talk about the topic. But I also have a tendency of drawing from all kinds of other places and dragging in all kinds of uninvited people. Nelson Mandela once told me off for doing that. I don't know if Dr. Ntoasa remember when we had a meeting at um, um, Bishop Tutu's place in Cape Town with the leaders who were in the country at the time and there was violence throughout our country and both Bishop Tutu and former President Nelson Mandela said we should all get together and think about how to, how to handle the situation in the country. Now for some reason, Nelson Mandela liked me. Now of course that's not to say I'm not likeable. <laughs> But he always said, Itumeleng, let's talk. At that meeting, and I will not spend time on that meeting, this time today is Eskiam Patel's time. At that meeting, President Mandela did one of the many other things that I violently disagreed with at the time. But as years went by, especially since he's been gone, I've had moments of saying, I actually should have listened to that old man. But that is life. One of the other things I did that day was to try and smuggle a meeting into a meeting. Because we were worried as a movement about what we as a nation were negotiating in Kempton Park. Now I must make things clear. We are known to have been against negotiations. Actually, we were not against negotiations. I can say so there's a president of the Black Consciousness Movement here, there's an Dwasa there, there's a number of other people here. They can tell you we were never against. We wanted to know what are we negotiating? And so Mandela says to me, I brought a few people, I will not say who they are, into that other meeting that I smuggled into the other meeting. And so he listened and listened and listened. And then he says to me, you always like to drag in other things that have nothing to do with what we are talking about here. And to drag in other people whose time this is not. When you want to talk to me, you must stick to what we agreed we're going to talk about. And you must only bring the people that we agreed we must bring to this meeting. I say that to say, that the reason you see books here is because I had no way of avoiding a whole number of ideas, people, traditions, histories, concepts. When I reflect on Prof. Eskiam Pathele, I have no way of avoiding them, given my tendency to get myself into trouble. I also am a pro a problematic in another way. In my other life, I preach. <laughs> and so as a preacher, I'm fairly ill-disciplined. We preachers are ill-disciplined. We prepare sermons to preach on one thing, and we end up 
spending time preaching on something else. So please forgive me. My topic for today is the missing variable and the wrong data set. Eskiam Patele, the intellectual. I want to spend the time paying tribute to the Mpantlele that I knew and the Mpantlele that I discovered. I do so not because others have not celebrated that Mpantlele, not because more esteemed people have not done so before me, not because more esteemed institutions have not already done so, but I do so because every occasion that commemorates and celebrates and remember Prof. Mpatele is a learning opportunity. I also do so by way of returning to the sources. Allah Amilka Cabral, in his book, Returning to the Sources, where he calls us back to our historical, our educational, our political, our intellectual sources as a way of searching for the abiding relevance of a man and his scholarly journey over the years. When Prof. Patele came back to the country and when I met him here on our own soil, I was smitten, I was taken aback. The man I read in Manchester was a giant that I did not have any right to even get close to him to tell him who I was. The man I encountered in the streets of Manchester, in a small little library, was the man whose humility, when I encountered it in Soweto, when I encountered it here in South Africa, was simply for the greats like him, and not for the arrogant, like us. I did not meet an academic. I met an intellectual. And so I borrow an idiom from linear algebra and data analytics. My background is theology, more specifically Old Testament. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't quite catch what this was. <laughs> I, I found the place I was looking for in the book. I told you that I didn't try to read the whole book. I didn't have the time to do so. I was never going to be able to do justice to that. But I found the place I was looking for in the book. And it was a discussion, a conversation with himself. It was a discussion about his country, 
his university, the University of South Africa, about his township, and about his village and his home. But it was a conversation with himself. He was in the 50s, 53, 57, and it was a time when someone who did not have the intellectual qualifications, and I didn't say academic, <laughs> who did not have the intellectual qualification that he had was passing a law in the country that declared black people an inferior nation. But what is more important is the exact words of this person. He says, it cannot be expected that a black person should study mathematics when they are never ever going to use mathematics. At that time, Professor Mpatlele had an honors degree in mathematics and English. And not soon thereafter, not, not, not long thereafter, he obtained a master's degree in English. And this non-English speaking person, this non-mathematician, actually put together a state policy that him, his people, his children should not be expected to learn mathematics because they are never ever going to use it. They are never going to live in a community where that mathematics is ready, is needed. So he talks about that in Down Second Avenue. And he reflects on it. And one day, he takes a decision. And the decision was, or he asks himself the question, to budge or not to budge. And then he says to himself, but who am I? Who am I to even think about that, to even ask that question? When there are so many other people, black people, African people, who like me have children, who, if I decide to budge, they will remain here and be subjected to the most horrible conditions that any nation and people can be subjected to. So he decides, maybe I will reflect on this. And he talks to his colleagues, he talks to his friends, he talks to his family, and then he comes back and he says, to budge or not to budge. He writes to people he knows outside of the country, he writes to friends that he knew. And he kept whispering, pesteringly, 
both to himself and to them, to budge or not to budge. He says, and I quote him, I was suddenly seized by a desire to leave South Africa for more sky to soar. So my question is, what was the missing variable? He was accomplished. He was lecturing at the University of Suffolk. We're talking about the 50s, long before our time, long before any of us dreamt of the possibility of a master's degree. He says, I had been banned from teaching. Conditions were crushing me. I was shriveling in the acid of bitterness. I was suffocating. I couldn't settle down to high-powered writing. I wanted to write. I despaired often about the education of our children, but I felt I had no right to save them by taking them away from South Africa instead of fighting, fighting it outside, uh, fighting it out side by side with those whose children are also being brought up in a police state. He didn't feel good about it. But the message kept coming to budge or not to budge. He was not the only one. There were a number of high school principals and teachers, black people around the country who were now faced with the prospect of having to come and teach their own children poison. They were expected to do so. They would be paid to do so. They probably did think about the possibility of getting around it. Oppressed people always do that. They, they always find a way of getting around things. He was not the only one. But there was a variable that was missing. To budge or not to budge. To stay on and work within the system and therefore remain in solidarity with those whose children were similarly having to endure the brutality of a police state and the dehumanization of its educational system, or to apply for a passport, as indeed he eventually did. But he fought with himself. And we know that eventually, Prof. Mpathele left the country. We know that many great educational minds like him also did leave the country. But what if they did not leave? What if they decided to stay? Would June 16 have happened? <laughs> Would Onkhopo Zetiro have stood his ground at the University of the North and pointed out to a hall full of white people, making the point to them that the people who should be inside this hall 
are outside of this hall. And the people who should be inside this hall, who should not be inside this hall, are inside this hall. What on Hopo have happened? Would Steve Bantu Biko have happened? Would the South African students that you recall, most of you, I told you I will not tell you secrets about my wife. But now it looks like I can't keep it away. Would the like of us? who had to continually run away from the police and from the army, who sometimes would have to greet a white person as if the white person is God, even though you didn't want to do that. On the eve of Nkhopotiro's parcel bomb in Botswana, just the week before he was killed, I went to hide some of my books at the nurse's home where my wife was training as a radiographer. Something told me, somebody else must hide these books for me. The reason I say I don't want to tell you secrets about my wife is because I didn't quite tell her what the books were about. I just asked her to please keep them. And in a day or two, Nkhopo Tituro had been killed by a parcel bomb in Botswana. And so Mpatlele, talked to himself. And he left. And so did others. But why did they leave? And what if they did not leave? I think when I listened to him, that he didn't want to leave, actually. But the data, the data structure was wrong. The political data structure was wrong. You can't do data science with the wrong data structure. He was never going to be able to be what he became. We would never have been sitting in this room today if he had tried to work with the wrong data structure. But there is more to it. There was also a missing variable. Let me explain what a missing variable is. Those of you who have seen a spreadsheet, spreadsheets are, are, are old now. They are no longer the, the modern things through which we do data, the data science and data analytics, but they're OK. But you will know what I'm talking about. When you have a spreadsheet, the spreadsheet has got cells in it, and sometimes the spreadsheet has, all the cells of a spreadsheet have information in them. But other times, the spreadsheet has missing data. Other times, the entire column of a spreadsheet is empty. And when that happens, there is a missing variable. Because in data science, columns are variables, rows, um, uh, rows contain information, your actual observations. Rows are observations. The more I read down Second Avenue, the more I suspect that there was a missing variable with regard to the situation in South Africa at that time. I told you I get myself into trouble. I'm looking for 
I'm looking for a statement. I'm looking for a statement. I'll find it. Don't worry. I'm looking for his statement. And so I have to find it at some point. So he left. He talks about He talks about going to find himself. Tell you what, I'll find it at the end. He said, I need to build up moral and mental reserves. It was on that point that he decided to leave. Please bear with me. I do get myself into trouble a lot of the time. He could not afford ignorance of the difference that he did not know. The deep and festering wound on the soul and mind of a great intellectual had been inflicted already when the Minister of Education, Hendrik Furwood, the father of apartheid, promulgated the Bantu Education Act and then proclaimed, as I said earlier, uh, that there is no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? I'm going to move away quickly from down Second Avenue to address another historical circumstance from somewhere else, by somebody else, whom I can't forget if I'm talking about Prof. Mpathele. His name is Abraham Wald. The context is the Second World War. I've moved away from South Africa now. The Jews are being hounded by the Nazis. Abraham Wald's hometown had become Romania by that time. Like Eskiam Pathele, his talent was in mathematics. The long and short of his story is that he, Abraham Wald, ended up in the USA as a refugee. I forgot to tell you that Eskiem Patele ended up in Nigeria and from Nigeria to the USA. After a few months in Colorado, where he had odd jobs in economics, his experience then earned him an offer to be part of a commission in Colorado Springs where he was doing odd jobs in maths and economics. A few months later, he was offered a professorship of statistics at Columbia. Jordan Ellenbeck, who writes about this Abraham Award, 
at the end of a little background that he gives on him makes the point that when he was offered a professorship instead at Columbia, he packed up once again and moved to New York. In the words of Eskiam Pathele, he barged. According to Ellen Beck, that job in New York was where he fought the war from a little building in Manhattan. He became part of a group called the Statistical Research Group. He spent much of his time with that group during the Second World War. The program, the research program that he was involved in was a classified program that yoked in the assembled might of American statisticians to help to fight the war. Ellen Beck says about him that that group of statisticians were developing different kinds of weapons from a room in Manhattan. They were developing equations, not explosives. And he says that the smartest person in the room was Abraham Walt. He was a foreigner, he was an exile, he was still an enemy. He was not technically allowed to see the classified reports that he was producing. The joke around the group was that the secretaries had been given instructions that they should pull each sheet of note paper out of his hands as soon as he had finished writing it. I know that Eskiam Patele, had he not budged, would have faced the same problem. You couldn't even write your own script and keep it. You, go to, you went to jail in this country for things that you yourself have produced. Walt was not allowed to see the reports that he was writing. His job was to correct, to, to his job was to develop correct equations based on the empirical data sets collected from the bodies of the warplanes that returned to America for service. The military collected the data and brought it to the statisticians. The data set was consisted of bullet holes per square foot on the, various, on the following variables. The engine, the fuselage, the fuel system, and the rest of the plane. The soldiers counted the holes on the planes and brought a data set, a spreadsheet, to the mathematicians and the statisticians. And the military question to the statistician was, on which ones of these bullets must we put armor to make sure that when the planes go back to war, they will be able to survive the bullets, the bullets of the Germans during the Second World War. Wall's answer was the armor doesn't go where the bullets are on the plane. 
it goes where the holes from the bullets are not. The armor is attached to the missing variable. Walt asked, you've given me the data on the holes. Where are the missing holes? And they were like me when I read down Second Avenue. I kept thinking, why must he leave? And he kept saying, I must budge. He knew where the holes are and he could fix them for us. We needed mathematicians in the country. We needed English teachers. We needed them parcelers. They would tell us how to fix the bullet holes. Walt says, and so did Mpatlele, that the armor is not required where the holes are. The armor is required where the holes are not. Where are the missing holes? The answer, of course, is the missing holes are on the missing planes. <laughs> Those planes that did not come back <laughs> because they were hit on a location that was the most vulnerable and they did not return for a service. It is those holes that we need to plug, not the holes with which they could still come back home to be fixed. To budge or not to budge. Of course, in the end, the mathematician says, there's an old trick that helps. When you have a missing variable in your data set, you must set that variable to zero. And that is what world and Patele do. His words are, I needed to build up moral and mental reserve. I left in order to build up moral and mental reserves. That is the missing variable. It was not here. It is a fundamental one for intellectuals. Patele set the variable of staying in the country to zero. Once this decision was taken and the realization had dawned on him about moral and mental reserve, he says in Down Second Avenue, I chose to go and teach in Lagos in Nigeria and in April I applied for a passport with very little hope of being given the passport. Many harmless Africans had been refused passports recently. True intellectuals are essentially the same breed. Let me veer off from Eskia and World. Iqbal Ahmad, a Palestinian intellectual, 
wrote an introduction to a book that records a conversation between Edward Said, Edward Said being one of the greatest Palestinian intellectuals, Said and David Bassiman. The book is entitled The Pen and the Sword. Now, Patella wrestled with the missing variable in 1957. Said did so in the early 1990s, just about the same time when political changes were taking place in South Africa. The passage of time notwithstanding, Iqbal Ahmad diagnoses Said's Said disease exactly the same way that Mpathele had diagnosed his own moral and mental reserve. He tells of an occasion some years back when three friends were dining together in a Beirut restaurant, himself, Said, and a friend from further east in the Orient. Suddenly, as they dined and convened, a violent firefight started nearby. The waiters scurried inside, leaving them the only diners in the courtyard. Instinctively, I stopped, says Iqbal, because I knew how things can be in Beirut. Go on, asked Said, as if nothing had happened. Iqbal then explains Said's missing variable. He says, when he is absorbed, he does not care. <coughs> Gradually, says Iqbal, I understood also that his absorption is willed and his courage is sustained by a lasting sense of intellectual purpose and moral outlook. Patele says, moral and mental reserve. Said says, intellectual purpose and moral outlook. And then Said says, said himself in an introduction in the Reef lectures that I was privileged to listen to way back in the 70s. He drives the, po the, the point home with uncompromising brutality. He says, nothing disfigures the intellectual, intellectual's perf public performance as much as trimming, careful silence, patriotic bluster, retrospective and self-dramatizing apostasy. And again, he says, there are no rules by which intellectuals can know what to say or do, nor the true intellectual No, for the true intellectual, are there any gods to be worshipped and looked to for unwavering guidance? And then even much closer to Eskiam Patele, he concludes about the condition of an intellectual. He says it is a lonely condition. Yes, but it is always a better one than a gregarious tolerance for the way things are, for the status quo. Real intellectuals, not academics, real intellectuals experience the same moment, the same desire, but they do not necessarily vote for the same path or conclusion. Eskiam Patele, I need to build up moral and mental reserve. The decision that followed from this experience and desire, and the desire that followed from it was to budge to leave, to depart, to quit the data frame that is represented by South Africa of old, to search for the missing variable, to set the variable to zero. Eskia left South Africa and went to Lagos in Nigeria in search of the optimum point on the curve. Edward Said had a similar moment, his courage being sustained by a lasting sense of intellectual purpose and moral outlook. 
special historical context for Said was the moment when he celebrated, when, when his celebrated friend and leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization entered negotiations for a settlement with Israel. Chairman Arafat represented the people of Palestine as a leader of the PLO, but the negotiations were supervised by the United States. Iqbal describes the historical context as follows. The PLO-Israeli negotiations began in the fall of 1992 in Boston before they found a neutral sponsor in Oslo. Said was invited to the, West, to, to the White House. He did not go. He watched the tawdry affair on TV. Clinton, like a Roman emperor, bringing two vassal kings to his imperial court and making them shake hands in front of him. Then there was the fashion show parade of star personalities. And most distressing of all were the speeches in which the Israeli Prime Minister Rabin gave the Palestinian speech full of anguish, Hamlet's anxiety and uncertainty, the loss, the sacrifice, and so on. But Arafat, his speech was in fact written by businessmen, and it was a businessman's speech with all the flair of a rental agreement. It appeared obscene that just as South Africa was breaking free, there was all this hoopla over creating a Bantu stand in Palestine. But Said's pain was obviously different and deeper. And so, let us conclude. Abraham Arles also had a moment. The armor does not go where the holes are. It goes where the bullet holes are not. This means that the real question is, where are the missing holes? And the answer is, the missing holes are on the missing planes. Those planes that did not come back from war because they had been hit on the most vulnerable. It was a real pleasure, a real, real pleasure for Professor Eskiam Pasele to return back to this land, this country, to this soil, and a privilege for us to have known him. He knew what the missing variable was. And he refused to work with a bad data frame. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Yes, I still uh, can't recover. We are privileged, all of us who are here and who are following this lecture. Um, through YouTube. The comment I made earlier on that uh, we're waiting for a very thought-provoking lecture, mouth-watering indeed, did not disappoint. It really came out the way we expected. <laughs> a gentleman who facilitated this lecture a few years ago um, when on the podium used to say 
trying to emulate what uh, Eskia and Patele would have said. He said, read and read and read and read. <laughs> so what for me this means is that we have been exposed to the value of reading. Listen to the contrasting experiences of different authors, all of whom whose ideas actually coalesce towards a particular point. Eskia and Patele ask the question, to budge or not to budge? And then we have Abram Walt working on statistical equations, asking the question, where are the missing holes? Some of us would have thought, let's just go for those holes because we can see them and think that's the way to solve the problem. But the question is, what about those planes that didn't come? These are the ones. This is where the problem lies. And as intellectuals, we need to try and find solutions. Not where things are so obvious, but try and look for the most obscure. I don't want to regurgitate and end up misrepresenting the, pre the lecture, but it was beautiful. We really enjoyed it. I hope we can just give them a guess. Thank you, thank you. Um, good news is that our, our poet that was involved in an accident is actually, wasn't that seriously hurt. So I have been informed that the poem pushed her and pushed her. And she was discharged. <laughs> Not only that, but that she's here. So I am, before the discussions come to the picture, going to give an opportunity to render that item which was meant for her. Sherofaj. to fall again. Okay? <laughs> Poet, poeticide. Take up your pen and stretch out your voice. Let the sun, stars, planets, and skies echo a deliverance of lives of a people whose tears run for miles, whose bodies are archives of files with punched pocket sleeves of oppression. Punched pocket sleeves of discrimination. Punched pocket sleeves of segregation. Punched pocket sleeves of Empty dreams, empty hopes, empty cares, empty days. Who dares to win? Who dares to even try? In a crumbling economy where all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't put the economy back together again. On broken glass, we walk barefoot. We try, yes, we try, to navigate our way in this broken economy. Scattered, shattered, bleeding. With our bare hands, we try to put the pieces of our livelihoods together, but we can no longer hold the pain. 
We can no longer hold the pain. We are only but young souls and we are calling on the African poets to poeticize. Take up your pen and stretch out your voice. Go deeper into the souls of our being. Speak things that we are unable to see. Speak of a time where the nation's rainbow really is the end of a storm. For we are drowning in $266.97 billion debts. We are breathing half the air, we are holding on to half our dreams, and we are saying, African poet, poeticize. Take up your pen and stretch out your voice. Speak to the king's men. Speak to the king's horses that these are crimes to humanity that a time will come where they will be charged with enslavement, for keeping us trapped in cycles of deprivation and poverty, for keeping us trapped without an opportunity. Poet, poeticize. Take up your pen and stretch out your voice. And stretch out your voice. Let them know that a time will come where South Africa will regain her voice again. Might, being, and strength. So poet, poetisa. Take up your pen and stretch out your voice. And stretch out your voice. And stretch out your voice. Let everything with an ear hear the dawning of a new day. The dawning of a new way. The dawning of a new song. you say. Um, I'm going to ask the discussants to ascend to the stage. I think these chairs are placed here for them. Professor Grace Kuno, as well as Hoshirali Muremali Mutab. Uh, with regards to protocol, uh, I want to say go Professor Lenkabula, Le Professor Musala, Kilakaleo. <laughs> um, I feel privileged. Uh, to stand here today to be respondent to a lecture given by Professor Musal. Um, Hansu Ubuwa 
my heart was singing. There was so much excitement in my being because I could see the pleasure in your face, the pleasure in your voice on having been given the opportunity to speak to the legacy of this giant of an African man. Kyalebuha, Professor Musala. Um, I want to thank Professor Musala for a refreshing take on the legacy of Professor Mpatlele. This lecture reminds us of the multiple angles we can use in an understanding or in dealing with the text that is Professor Mpatlele. This text that is Professor Mpatlele is important in helping us read and understand our multiple contexts, but also in helping us understand and anticipate our futures. Before I share my thoughts on the lecture, I must confess, <laughs> Professor Musala, that you al almost lost me when you started talking about zeros, missing variables, statistics, spreadsheets, and, and, and data numbers. I'm one of those whose senses left that last room during math lessons. I'm however grateful for how you were able to use this metaphor to illustrate the multiple sides of Ntate Mpathele. As someone who develops a headache when numbers enter a conversation, I marvel at how your ability to drag things that are not supposed to be dragged in was quite useful and thought-provoking in helping us revisit whom Pasele was, what his life means for us, but most importantly, what his multiple works can contribute in allowing us to build successful futures. Professor Musala Wakapa, Limkuele. Professor Musala Wakapa, he asks, are you an intellectual or an academic? <laughs> Professor Musala, you talk, your talk evokes a few concepts. It, it evokes exile, it, it evokes intellectual, it, it evokes the idea of moral and mental reserves. It helps us recognize how challenges can birth masterpieces. We see this in the life that was in Tatem Patel. The challenges he experienced when he asked the question, to budge or not to budge, created the man that has led, led us to this room tonight. Challenges can birth masterpieces. And how those of us who want to be considered intellectuals can and should find opportunities for nurturing our moral and mental reserves from the challenges we find ourselves facing. As intellectuals, when we find challenges, it's an opportunity. It's an invitation for us to raise our hand, to say, Tumamin. Roman, not because the journey is going to be easy. Roman, because I want to be calm. Because if I sit in my comfort, I will become nothing. We are here today because Ntatem Pasele decided to become something. I remember many years ago, I was invited to, to speak at a friend's graduation. And I remember when we were at university together, we were hungry together. We shared bread together. And I remember Someone saying at the, at the, at the uh, graduation, Hore, he had it easy. He, he had all the opportunities. And I remember correcting and saying, uh, he, we are celebrating this man today because he left his mother's bosom. He went to vets where he was a black man, where he was a problem. He went to vets as a black man Poor, where the definition of what we know to be a man did not, did, did not include him. And he enjoyed and came back with a degree. Mpatele did the same. 
He left the comfort or the assumed comforts of home. I find that your challenge to us, as framed in your reading of the life and thoughts of Mpatele, is illuminating. What does it mean to be an African intellectual in the current context? And what does it mean to be an African intellectual as we anticipate our futures? And how does Mpatele assist us in doing so? In responding to your talk, I want to problematize the idea of exile in the case of Mpatele's time outside of South Africa. He lived and worked in multiple countries in the continent, including Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and Zambia. His travels also took him to the West, including the United States and France. From these varied experiences, he writes about how he, I quote, developed from small South African beginnings to an African consciousness from a mixed up, uprooted ghetto academic and teacher to a person whose whole personality was to be sensitized to the pulse and rhythm of our continent. I close quote. In France, he impacted how they think about their everyday. He impacted how they think about their culture. This contribution was illustrated in the award he was honored with in 1984, the Order of the Palm by the French government for his contribution to French language and culture. He barged, he barged. That's why he was able to leave home and impact the West. How many of us think that we can impact a place where we know we are not wanted. He barged. Are barging. Let's barge. Let's move. Let's not be afraid. Uh, 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 Professor Musala Ari, uh, when he reads um, Patele, he, he finds that he struggled. He in particular struggled to budge or not to budge. Kisa maye, kisa maye mo limpopo mo kumu na trois chisa. Kie kai, he he struggled. It was not easy. Who said it will be easy? But he budged. The dilemma to budge or not to budge was an invitation he could not have you re refused. Professor Musala, you are correct. He had to apply for the passport, and he did. That's not a choice. I want to be controversial and suggest that, that we consider the possibility that his time outside of South Africa and in, the, and in the embrace of his African brothers and sisters in Ghana, in Kenya, in Nigeria, was not exile, but an opportunity to fill his depleted moral and mental reserves, as Professor Musala suggests. In writing about his experiences in exile, Mpatele suggests that, I quote, I could almost hear the heartbeat of Africa, close quote. How many of you can hear the heartbeat of Africa? Hmm? I ask this question because we are dealing with xenophobia daily. And the reason why we are xenophobic is because we are unable to hear the heartbeat of the continent. Because Africa is us, and we are Africa. So Mpasele could hear the heartbeat of Africa by leaving home. He, ha he allowed himself the possibility to hear the heartbeat of Africa. In the foreword of lasting tribute, I'm led to believe that in Ghana, in Nigeria, and other African countries, he was home in ways he could not be home in apartheid South Africa. I ask colleagues, are you comfortable or do you want to soar? What is your not budging, stealing from us and our futures? 
What are you willing to exile so as to make a lasting contribution like Professor Mpatlele? This idea of exile. My encounter with conceptions of exile is of an experience that is dehumanizing. But this dehumanizing, this pain of exile, was felt and experienced by, by Mpatlele here in South Africa. Because ex apartheid was exiling. He felt in exile here at home. That's why he had to budge. He had to find a home. In your paper, Professor Musala, you write about how his dilemma to budge or not to budge was a result of his being banned from teaching. You show how in 1957 he was consumed by the desire to soar as a result of the crushing he was experiencing from not being able to teach. I think this crushing resulted from not being able to teach, the resulting from not being able to teach was more exile than his time in other parts of the continent. In Kenya, in Sierra Leone, in, in, Sierra Leone, in Zambia, he soared because he was able to teach. I think teaching was life itself for him. In an article on Romanian intellectuals and exile, Stragaru suggests that for these intellectuals who were forced to leave their country by a repressive state, exile was experienced as a better choice. I quote, instead of considering exile as the final form of punishment, these intellectuals viewed it as a chance of cultural rebirth. They changed the status of exiled inside their native country from that of stranger abroad because through exile, they gained something of immense value. They gained freedom of opinion and freedom of thought, end quote. I find that this was the same for, for, for Professor Mpatele. Exile was an opportunity for him to finally hear the heartbeat of Africa. To hear one's heartbeat, one had to be sober. Hearing is a result of a deeper alignment with one's essence. Knowing yourself and what makes you, you. The stillness required for this ability to hear the heartbeat of the continent comes from filling that cup of moral and mental reserves that you talked about, Professor Musale. And you can't fill it by sitting in comfort. From this alignment with the heartbeat of Africa, Mpatlele was able to not only set the tone for debate on questions of teaching and the teaching profession, but on conceptions of what it means to be an African. In one of his articles titled Being and Becoming African, he shares the following ideas for thinking about the importance and power of naming ourselves. I quote, what about us, the oppressed in this country? Are we always going to be labeled and defined by the government and the media with names that are going to humiliate us, close quote. This question was important during apartheid and it remains more so now, as the war now rages in unfamiliar territories. We see growing xenophobia, we see looting of our purse, our money, our, pe our personal purse is being looted. There's violence, there's war. We see this war continuing in the demeaning tendencies against women leaders, in government, in business, and unfortunately, in the education sector, in the academy. This, this is a problem. We, we need to name ourselves. We need to take responsibility for defining who we want to be. And Mpatlele provides us with the tools to do that. Mpatlele's intellectual contributions remain a reservoir for us to use as we endeavor to feel our depleted, like seriously depleted moral and mental reserves. One of the central tenets of doing this is love. Lerato. Love. A people who do not love themselves, 
will not do loving things for each other. And this means they will not do loving things for their children and for their children's children. Let's budge, colleagues. Galibur. Thanks very much. Before I start, may I kindly request Mpatele Femeli Manala Marasa to rise so that we give them a round of applause, please. Mpatele Femeli. Mpatele. Reale Boga. Rabangabaye. royal family you might not be knowing in the know for a prof Ezekiel Pasele was a prince from Mpatele dynasty we have Magasa Manala and then Manala his clan so Thank you very much, uh, University of uh, South Africa, for inviting me. And thank you very much, uh, Prophet Mele Musala, for a thought-provoking lecture. It was indeed thought-provoking and highly appreciated. And my greetings to all of you this evening. Tobela. I don't know whether Abu Shen is appropriate. Liperile, <laughs> yes, thank you. Liperile, good evening. As I've alluded to, the memorial lecture was really thought provoking, with a thought provoking topic indeed. One that was apparently also influenced by the fact that the honoree, being Prof. Eskiam Pasele, did study mathematics as well. The question to bash or not to bash, faced with the paralyzing, death dealing apartheid context that stirred him in the face. Prof. Eskiam Pasele, known as Makaha and Makubela, had to grapple with the following question, which had to lead to a decisive decision to bash or not to bash. The lecture, and rightfully so, assumes that in apartheid South Africa, at least from our black South African context, Normative humanity was a black man. In this case, indeed, black male intellectuals. The latter indeed makes perfect sense in our African patriarchal context in which girl children were viewed as resident aliens in their own home spaces. And hence the Jamaican proverb Marry your girl as soon as you can, and your boy when you like. It was thus viewed as wasteful to educate a girl child. In a nutshell, if the honoree was a black female intellectual, may she have had the luxury to ask such a question? If so, how would she have answered it? <coughs> Program director, given the fact that issues of sexism and classism were not a priority for black liberationist intellectuals then, and perhaps 
to a greater extent even today. Had they chose to remain in the country, would we, for example, be having Professor Lingabua as a principal and vice chancellor of UNISA? I doubt. <laughs> to cite but just a few examples, as of now, we have a number of CEOs of state-owned enterprises, though minimal. We have a number of women professors, however, the insignificant number of black female professors that we presently have, presently have. There are patriarchal tendencies prevalent in our society. And also the issue of migrant labor system also played a role for women to kept on waiting and waiting and waiting. You know very well that women, mostly in rural areas, even when you read in down Second Avenue, you know that originally Prof. Eskian Pahlele come from Maupane, Siliteng, Ram Pahlele, where Prof. Masinya originate from. A dusty rural area. These migrant laborers will only see their wives during Easter or December holidays. And that you know very well that led to this disintegration of families because of structured apartheid system and mostly affecting us blacks. In a book written by Professor Njabulo Ndebele on the life of Winnie Madikizela Mandela, one encounters the harsh reality of the feature of waiting as that which by hook or crook, typified by the life of a black South African woman waiting for husbands who skipped the country, who were exiled in Robben Island, some never to return, some to return, let's hope I'm not becoming sensitive, ne? <laughs> to return and divorce the wives, yet some to reun reunite with their families, among others. Even as our mothers and foremothers learned or were forced to wait then, the same trait appears to still typ typify us even today. We kept, we kept on waiting to be professors. We kept on waiting to have a woman president. We kept on waiting to have women premiers. A woman Hoshi, leading National House of Traditional Leaders and seven houses of traditional leaders. How the barging, barging of Prof. Eskiam Pasele assisted in human struggle. I fully concur with you, Prof. Itimele Musala, that had he or they stayed, remained in the country, we wouldn't be having this slight change that we are seeing today. It's very true that they were going to be stagnant and eventually their lives were going to deteriorate or get arrested because of that system of that time. How the barging of Professor Eskiam Mpatlele assisted in addressing the plight of people and families of rural communities of Maupaneng, Mpatlele, a village that gave birth to the honorary. There is marginalization of women in most sectors of our society. You are aware? B 
building, there is uh, that notion as the, the one Professor Itumele Musala referred to of building a moral and mental reserves. Very, very critical. We should internalize this memorial lecture, looking at how it impacts on us as a society, as a nation. Emulate Professor Eskiam Patele's result of the building of moral and mental reserve. A critical question one may ask will be, should the building of moral reserves happen only in areas devoid of repression and oppression? Prof. Eskiam Patele's response to the question would have been positive and hence his decision to bash. Can I go to? But how many of those of us who sit at the bottom of the patriarchal and socioeconomic ladder, ladder have the luxury to live? How many black South African women who are still heavily reliant on their husbands or partners to have the luxury to budge out of their violent marriages? We are aware that uh, Prof. Eskiam Pashele Mokhaka, philosophy was African, African humanism, promotion of Ubuntu, Ubuntu. The concept of individualistic attitude is foreign, very foreign to our culture, for very foreign to humanism. It's Western, as one uh, speaker has referred to. I therefore urge all of us who are here tonight to emulate Professor Eskiam Mpatlele, philosophy, of African humanism. We can't afford in this era in which we are living in to see our women and our children being violated. We can't afford to see these triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and poverty, unemployment, inequality getting so rife in the 28 years of our democracy. Had Professor Eskiam Patele not budged, I don't think all these positive things which we are seeing today, no matter minimal they might be, being so visible. I therefore fully agree with you, Professor Itumele, that the budget of Professor Eskia had a positive impact on our country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, this is the time now to ask uh, questions or perhaps just pose some short comments based on the presentations uh, that, have been, um, that have been made. In the interim, uh, Professor Musala um, is being uh, asked to do an interview, so um, if you can ask those questions that they be directed to the discussions, at least at this point in time, until he's back. Any questions, comments? That's the opportunity you have now. We'll have the mic, uh, Rovi mic around. 
Yes, there's one. And um, there's another hand on the other side, yes. So if you could just start with your question. Th thank you very much. Uh, it seems I may be reading uh, Professor Kuno wrong. It seems she still encourages us to budge. Even now when we have the freedom of speech and freedom of thought that this country faces so many challenges and intellectuals seems to be thinking budging will be the solution instead of dealing with issues that faces this country. I'm just saying, I think the intellectual have gone into hiding when they should be leading the solutions to the issues that affect the country. They seem to be promoting any status quo that comes. Thank you. Thank you. Can, uh, can I have the other question? And then if there are no other questions, I will ask the discussants to comment, to respond. And, yes. and uh, thank you very much. Are you aware that uh, what you are wearing is a South African brand? And then, and, and, and then there are no other South African brands. Young we get Zwanke Zambak. There are not others. But uh, I'm going to say, if people are there, they escape back to the area. In his down second view book, and he says. There is African spinach. Naganala ora or tebe nil root. And do you think or there are other European people who can teach us that? Because we are taught by those. I don't know. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, and there's a hand here. There's a hand here next to the camera. Here. Okay, and then you, you will be at least for this round, be the last person, and then they can respond. Um, thank you very much. Mine is not more of a question, but um, it's more, oh, OK, thank you. Um, I would like to say, when you speak about the budging, I believe that budging for the right reasons brings positive results wherever you are. Uh, in the context of uh, Eskia, particularly with the initiative that he did in Kenya, I believe one of the authors who rose was Ngugi Watiyo. Um, in uh, 2013, he later came back in acknowledging that by the time he came, he raised uh, one of uh, the facilities. Um, I might misspell the letter, I think it was Chem Cheng, something like that, where he later fantasized on how to become a writer and those that comes there. So to the notion to say, is budging good or a bad? My answer will be budging for the right reasons. It exposes one to certain things that the environment where you are comfortable will never give you those. OK, no, thank you. That was a comment. Thank you. Um, I, I, yes, yes. And, yes, and, um, Professor Musala, we say there's academics and there's intellectual. So anyone can become an intellectual. The academics are the ones who are sitting in universities and they're not doing the work that, that, that uh, Professor Musala was speaking about. The work that defines or defines uh, Professor M M M um, in the video, we saw colleagues speak about research and the kind of research they engage in. 
and one of them was Professor Buleni Sekhali. And she talked about engaged scholarship, where she works within the community, where, where she theorizes from the experiences of women. And, and that is intellectual work, where you don't sit in the ivory tower. So, so I agree with you, we agree, we agree. But, but I just wanted to add that there's that dynamic that Professor Musala spoke about, that there's academics and intellectual. So we have a lot of academics, but we want to develop intellectuals. And that's why we need people to budge. Uh, because the fact that we have a constitution doesn't mean that we understand what it means to be free. What does freedom mean? Freedom is very complicated. It requires a lot of responsibility. Many of us don't know what it means to be free. So we are not free, we still need to budge. And, and budging in this context, in the context of this lecture, is positive. Because, because I, I'm, I'm using it from how uh, Professor Musala spoke about it. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's true, isn't it? No lecturer from Harvard will know what African Spanish is. So now we know African Spanish, you are referring to in Zulu, Tepe Kimbuya, I get it. Then you will be referring to Tepe, you are referring to Munyagu, Lesanya Mutagaraga, and all those. But a professor from Harvard and all those universities. Well, no, he will be thinking, well, this is referring to the Spanish that we know. But Prof. Ezekiel Patlele, in his book, he was referring to Mirogo Yeo Kamoka Yarina, Le Mool Kamoka Le, Yeo Kamoka Rivijan Kamayina Afapane. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other comments, questions? Okay, um, yes, I see Professor, Professor Lenkabula, the principal, and also um, I forgot to ask that people should identify themselves. I think I know the gentleman, but I forgot his name, but when you get the mic, please do uh, introduce him. Ntswani, right. Ntswani, yes. Uh, Prof. Lengabu. Oh, kia leboa, uh, Prof. Naki Buleng Lengabu, la kile puting la kwa se 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 solo san kuna manta tis. Jale kipole se. Kiko pavo tabo ne hurena. In the variables, se uli reflect ilengaton. Let a professor a reflect ilengaton. Ki defin te misa. Because the, the discourse of individual separated from the community without also the continuing experience of oppression <coughs> through neo-colonial lens may make us feel as though the intellectual or the academic has attained the future. And the reason why I ask this question is because the colleague to my left asked to Rena, do we need to budge? Is it necessary? And Keipoto Rena, does it really, uh, uh, um, are, are there those variables that we need to attend to, including in the universities around this notion that you have deeply dealt with, yeah, the intellectual and the academic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the mic there, please. Um, are there good questions this side while we're waiting? <laughs> thank you. Like Lin Zwan. It's not a question, but a comment. I was very happy to 
Yeah, what uh, Professor Mosala once discussed this topic not far from where we are here with Eskim Patele. It was on a Sunday morning. I think it was just a few streets up here. We were members of Copano Readers Club and we used to meet with him. That day we were discussing this question of uh, intellectuals. You know what he said? Prof. Mbatlele said, an intellectual is one who owns knowledge. Who owns knowledge? Not necessarily a professor from university with a string of degrees who when he arrives home they rush to take his back and say he's from work. That one is just an academic, not an intellectual. So then I asked him a question. I said, you know, my grandmother can't read and write. How do you describe her? You know what Prof said? He said to a grandmother because he knows uh, indigenous knowledge. Your grandmother is an intellectual, not necessarily ac academic. That's what he said that Sunday afternoon, not far from where we are here. And I loved that. Okay. It's just a comment. All right, we have another hand uh, close by here. Thank you very much, Program Director. My name is Macheli Di Sampatlele. We are very proud to have uh, an intellectual in our dynasty, a beacon of hope, a fountain of wisdom, an oak tree that has survived all kinds of weather. In one of his articles titled, I Hear the Slamming of Doors, he said, I quote, we don't have many skills, skilled in technicians nor educationists trained to take charge of the process of renewal in our curricula and school management, close quotes. During the 10th memorial lecture that was held at this very university, students were complaining about the type of education given to our children and to us from the primary, secondary, and tertiary level. In the very same article, Professor Eskia continued to say, I quote, will someone whisper to our teachers that we must fight on at least two fronts? Number one, teach, evaluate textbooks, create our own text from the best sources, and focus on learners to combat ignorance because knowledge is growth and power, close quotes. My question is, uh, are we on the right path to change the curricula of our education in this country? Thank you. Right. Um, we have those uh, uh, three. Uh, okay, there is another hand um, here. My name is Pule Munan. Uh, coming to occasions such as this, sometimes one feels very intimidated. <laughs> but uh, somehow I got liberated when the professor 
distinguished between an intellectual and an academic. We are faced with a problem in the country where somewhat I feel that when people get into academia, they develop a sense of fear. They refuse to tell the truth. They massage the truth. And yet, society looks upon them to, to lead them. If you look at our country today, we are in this model because the intellectual is silent. We are in this problem because the intellectual fears to tell the truth. We are in this problem because those who are not intellectual do not know what to do with the problem that they are facing because no one is there to liberate them. I think what if If Mdadim Patel was alive today, he probably would not be happy with many of you intellectuals. He wouldn't be. In fact, he would be ashamed that you are faced with a problem, but you are taught to massage the problem, hoping that something will happen, it will go away. And that's not what Mpatala stood for. That he had to go to exile is because he was overwhelmed by the problem with which he, can, he couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But I think we are here now. We should be able to deal with that. The budging means budging it here, not in exile. Thank you. All right, I'll defer my discussion. Um, and perhaps the guest speaker, if they would like to venture as an opinion as well. I'll start with the discussions and to Prof. Musab. Um, let me respond to the one raised by Prof. Lengabua regarding uh, missing variable. My take is that, uh, okay. My take is that we should recognize uh, women for who they are. They mustn't be kept waiting in a very, very long queue. Their achievements should be celebrated. They should be recognized as such, as fellow human beings, like they are mean folk. And then, uh, it's true. Indigenous knowledge in terms of Western culture. It's not good for our bodies. Let's see, Bagir. But that indigenous knowledge, very, very vital. And then I leave most of uh, the, the last two were comments by Ntatemunamale. The, 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 the more remote. Thanks so much. Um, the, the, the missing variables ring up. There's a lot of them. And I think some of the colleagues, Hans Reza, questions and comments, they spoke to some of them. Um, fear is one big one. And what I've, what I've, I've experienced personally is that what that does uh, in any institution is that it gives power to the weak because the weak becomes the bullies and because those bullies are then feared then they become strong and then they bully the next person and then they bully the next person and then institutional cultures shift for the west so fear is one of the biggest ones 
Um, and then mem pahlele mono ubu ile ka um, lack of renewal. And and I think that's also a very big one that we we think we have arrived, and therefore we are unable to renew. Um, re 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 aparadisuto, and and we think that uh, what the the West the Western leaders left for us is what we must take on and, and run with. When the reality is that the institutions that we are leading have a lot of problems, and they have not been left with our good with our good in mind, and and thus we have to we have to which is the next variable we have to take on the responsibility to define because if we are defining then someone else will define for us who we are what we must eat how we must preserve our food and that kills us in turn so the variables are multiple the other thing that i wanted to say is that um the metaphor ya budging for na it means if you need to leave the country, do that. There are people who need to leave the country so that they can grow. Others need to apply for a promotion. Some must resign and find another job somewhere else. Someone must go back to school. Someone must get books and read. So budging in, in this context that has been said by Professor Mosala yeah. is, 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 is very, it is huge. It means look at yourself. Ipatle mm. wipatle sise and figure out what budging means for you. Because all of us can budge somehow. You know, but because of the lies that we tell ourselves we, 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 fight, we, 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 we fight, we 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 work, we work for, for pay. What kind of a people are we? we you know how you are so controllable. Do what you love. Whether you get it or not, do what you love. They did that. People who came before, uh, they died for that. Capitalism has been fixed in such a way that we will not win. Because this threat, we must slow it down by changing and defining what it means to be us now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are you? Do you want me to stand, rather? <laughs> okay. How does I have to? Okay. Yeah. The vice chancellor here has been um, calling me to order. <laughs> <laughs> you get yourself into trouble. And saying to me, um, "Banas fanze bapas." <laughs> Don't give. Uh, uh, a false impression here that um, uh, because 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 it is important to be an intellectual, therefore you shouldn't <coughs> you shouldn't bother to be academically developed. Um, the the two go together actually, but when intellectuals used to die the truth. Academics were not in charge because academics had become intellectuals. <laughs> of course, intellectuals that don't know anything are not intellectuals <laughs> either. <laughs> um, the, the Italian um, philosopher Antonio Gramsci made the point a long time ago that all people are born as intellectuals. Some work as intellectuals, some <coughs> don't work as intellectuals. For others, the what you call the traditional intellectuals, kiba bashuma, bashuma 
Um, but now you need health labor. Okay. They need to go beyond that. They, they need to, we need to be able to, you know, let, let me tell you something. I, I'm not allowed to talk about the, 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 the commission um, and what we saw in the last three and a half years every day. For me, I don't know for the judge, I don't know for the lawyers and the investigators, I don't know for them. For me, as an academic and intellectual, my question was, where were the intellectuals when this was happening? And where are they now? Where are they? This is the question that you ask in the Demona. They used to die for this country. Okoputsutiro <laughs> could not finish his degree because he had to stand up for the truth before he finished his qualifications. He went to teach in Soweto in the schools and generated a movement that led to June 16th. Steve Bigo was at a medical school studying to be a doctor. He never finished because there was a country to die for. Mandela spent 27 years in jail when the Takaza Highway getting rich outside here. <laughs> uh, he didn't, he had to buy <laughs> and end up in prison for that time. When he went to when he came out into exile, I was in Botswana at the time, and we spent some time together. And he went back to study at UNISA. <laughs> After years in prison on Robben Island, he went to complete his academic studies. When he was an intellectual, he had to be ready to spend time on the island. I was talking to someone the other day, and I will not, in the light of what I saw in Twitter about me and this lecture the other day, I will not talk about some <laughs> things again. <laughs> because somebody threatens me, Hore, he, he will tell people what I once said about that is Zuma. Now, I don't know what, ever, what could I have said to him about that is Zuma. Be that as it may, I wanted to say that when the Kham Museneke was in prison and that is Zuma arrived in prison, that is Zuma and the Kang studied together. The Kang, I think, was start, finished his metric. Deputy Chief Justice the Kang finished his metric on the island. His intellectual commitment stopped his studies out here. He had to finish that on the island. He told me that he used to take an routine and that is how to write. Now I say this as a good guy But I'm saying I'm saying these two things go together and I think this is what the Vice Chancellor was concerned about. But if you are just an academic, if if if, if there is if all you are is just an academic, you haven't bashed. You have to be more than an academic. You have to be an intellectual. So I, I, I appreciate the discussion that, that's been happening here. It is important. We, should, we can't say to people they must ignore academic work. Otherwise, we, 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 we ourselves spend all these years. And that's also what that day. He didn't say, I want more degrees, Professor Patele. He didn't say so. He didn't say, I'm leaving to go and get more degrees. He says, I want to build my intellectual and moral outlook. 
That's what made him budge, intellectual and moral outlook. So I'm supporting some of the discussions. There's a dialectical relationship between these two things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I, I'll say that uh, I brought the, the, the question and, um, and answer session to an end now. Um, I don't, I know there are still some nagging questions coming, but because I don't want us to sleep here, I'm going to bring that part to the end. So thank you very much, discussants. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, which then uh, brings us to the uh, next item, uh, which is the remarks by the Mpatele family. Uh, Dr. Komani Mpatele, please come to the fore and uh, um, we, we are all ears. Uh, program director, let me also start where Professor Musala started and indicate that I also brought my books. <laughs> but it's, the weight is still smaller. I still have to be a professor before I could carry the same load as his. Thank you, Program Director, for giving me this opportunity to make few remarks on behalf of the Mpatele family. Permit me to start with two apologies. The first one comes from Puso Mpatele. His praise name is Nguatu, the surviving uh, progeny of Professor Eskia Mpatele. He couldn't be with us uh, today due to circumstances beyond his control. But he is wishing us well in this lecture. Secondly, an apology from Mr. Panke Pascal Mpachele, the deputy chairperson of the Enskia uh, Foundation. He also couldn't be with us uh, today uh, he is in Gauteng, uh, but he is extending well wishes uh, to all of us. The Vice Chancellor has uh, greeted all of us and has welcomed all of us. And therefore, with your permission, Program Director, I'm going to say protocol observed. But allow me to just uh, all acknowledge in our presence one uh, presence, I mean one leader uh, who has been a role model and who under whom I served when he was in government and Mr. Musibudi Mangena. I worked with him when he was the deputy minister in education when we launched the strategy for math science and technology education. And then when I moved to the, depart the newly formed Department of Science and Technology, he followed me. <laughs> <laughs> and when I graduated from UNISA, a doctorate in education, I requested him to be the speaker. He accepted the invitation, and he wrote a speech for me which is still in my archives. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I say Dr. Mangena, Minister Mangena? Uh, all together, thank you very much. Uh, the family uh, of Mpasel, especially the foundation, requested me to speak on their behalf uh, because of the reasons that I just advanced earlier. And they want to express sincere weight of gratitude to all of you who are here, especially the speakers, all of you, 
I will, in my remarks, just relate and try to make sense of the wealth of contributions you have given us. But allow me to start first by extending appreciation to Me Sirofajo Monama, who demonstrated that indeed mental reserves work. And let's give you a round of applause. With your words, you linked us with our ancestors through your poetry. We were all inspired and we feel motivated to continue to sustain the legacy of Professor Eski Ampasene. The insights and wise counsel shared with us by Professor Musala are well received and appreciated. Indeed, let me just uh, be frank with you. It is for the first time that I sit in a table of Professor Muxala and uh, Dr. Mangena together in this historic. So <laughs> uh, that picture, I'll treasure it for the rest of my life. Uh, these are individuals and leaders who are always gracing our television sets. These are the people who have written that we read about on daily basis. These are the people that we listen to them attentively trying to grab messages all the time. Now to sit next to them, it means through osmosis. I'm not, I'm not going to read them now. It will just be internalized. It would be appropriate, a program director, uh, to thank the discussants, Professor Kuno Emme Khojigadi Muremadi Mutapo, for having allowed us to penetrate and understand the message, message that Professor Musala has given us. And we thank you heartily for having done so. I will, as we interact with your your ideas, also share with you what the Mpatele family is trying to make sense of your wise counsel. And the two things that are emerging uh, will come to the uh, to the topic that uh, Professor Musala has has shared with us. Uh, but there's an issue of naming that has emerged from the discussions. And uh, there was also issue of how African communities are organized into the horror. So in the case of naming, Ezekiel Mpahlele, his great-grandfather was Ezekiel. Now what he did, although it was a colonial name, he, he appropriated it and and, and tend it and owned it. And now it's Eskia. Now all of us have taken that, what was colonial, what was negative, you appropriate it and you Africanize it. And that's how he was. He'll take English, but speak it in African idiom. And he will say, I heard it from the goat by the roadside. An Englishman will not understand it. But he got a distinction in English. Cum laude. And that is what it means. I'll quote one or two uh, later when I close. How he managed to take that foreign language, colonial language, and own it, and turn it upside down, and then communicate it the way he wants to communicate it. The owners of the language feel bewildered. They say, you don't, that's not how we say it. But he says, no, it's my language now. I own it. And so we'll come to it. Thank you, Prof. And uh, Eskia also had an African name. It is Litove. And because of the naming, and he also comes from a horror called Manala. And because he, he also has a praise name called Mazwi. All those names, if you follow them, they tell you his roots, where he comes from. Incidentally, the other Mpahlele uh, comes from the same Choro Manala. It is Moses Mpahlele, Manhattan Mpahlele, who composed the national anthem. 
the Sutu version. And then I'm going to use some quotations from his poems, because most of us do not know that he was not only a poet, he was a, not only a musician, but he was also a poet, a lyricist. And he's got many, many poems that he has written which are not published. But as Professor was, say, was sharing with us his wisdom, I then went into this book where we, we included some of uh, Moses and Patel's poems. And then I'll share with you some of the paragraphs that resonate with what you were saying. And also with the philosophy of African humanism that Eskian Patlele advocated for. <coughs> now, let me now go to the two, in fact, uh, the, the poems that I think seem to be resonating with what Eskian Patlele was promoting. One is called African, Africa, My Native Land. The other one is Bantu's Prayer. The other one is Muntu's Complaint. Muntu, Muntu, Mutu. Muntu's Complaint. And then th he, they also wrote in, well, not Eskia, but he wrote also in Sisotu, both Northern and Southern Sotu, Moses and Patlele. And the other one that he wrote in, in Sisotu is Morupa Wal Lahorunya Addis Ababa. But I think the two that seem to resonate with the theme of African hum humanism are two. Is the one Africa my native land, and the other one is Bantu's prayer. Now, when Professor Musala said in his other life he's also a preacher, I then thought about a paragraph in Moses Mpatlele's Africa my native land. It reads as follows. In case you doubt the truth of this, ask every Mundu that you meet who Satan was in native tongue. And what did native tongue was hell. He'll straight away look down at his feet and speak same words but the spelling wrong. So that is Moses in Parcele Manchatling. And you'll know that Iskia wrote a lot about spirituality and religion and Chechenity. But the other one, I think, which now is even more forward looking. I mean, he wrote this in the 40s and 30s, Moses Mpatlele, but it still resonates with us. And it's, a, it's an appeal to all of us. And it is in Bantu's prayer. In Bantu's prayer, he says, dismiss from us this visible hell that aches our mind like funeral knell. Restore to us thy former grace, and so of your we shall thee praise. These are the words of Moses and Patlele. He was also a poem. So it's, it's no wonder he gave us one of the greatest gifts, which is Morena Volokas Chavasavi. So let's give him a round of applause. Now, Eskia was building on this legacy of the Mpatheles. Uh, not only Moses Mpathele, Lilian Ngoi also is a relative of Moses. Uh, Svako Mahat, who also grew up at Rampathele under the tutelage of Mutle III and so on. So you could see there's been a culture in the first African community school built in Southern Africa by Mutle III. There's been that culture in the early 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, and Eskia became a product of that. Now, he is advising us, uh, Eskia Mpatlele, and he says, and I'm sure you've seen it many times, but I think it still resonates with us as we were engaging, I was listening to all of you. You were echoing his words, and he was saying, Africans, let us find ourselves happening to events instead of always responding to events happening to us. And so today, we have gathered here to find a way to happen to events rather than always responding to events happening to us. And that is what Eskiam Patel is saying, and that is what I think the message that uh, Professor Musala has indicated. So I guess this lecture 
enables us to happen to the unfolding post-1994 narrative. Thanks to Professor Musala for helping us to find the missing variable, the moral and mental reserve. And just to quote again Eskia, Eskia is further says, the external theme of a victim who hollers from the depths of a pit for a tyrant to lower the ladder just won't do. He advises us to make the transition in our minds from the status of bleeding victim to that of the proactive initiator who knows what changes he wants. And I think we're trying to say as Mpatlele family, we resonate with the message you have given us, Professor Musala. Thanks for alerting us and pointing us in the right direction to use appropriate data sets to transition into the African humanist future. So the variable that became obvious to us in this memorial lecture is very profound and it's a prescription that all of us will take back to go and treat ourselves, to recover ourselves, to embolden ourselves. And we will not allow any despair and we know that most of us are lacking the reserves anymore. We are finished, we are depleted. But you gave us a formula. And we will go back and making sure that we'll continue to work amongst others with UNISA and all of you African humanists who represent various organizations to realize this goal of making sure that we get the formula right and we use the right data sets in order to make sure that the legacy of Esikiam Patlele is sustained. I thank you. Thank you uh, for those uh, uh, words, Dr. Komani and Patlele. Um, uh, pretty much still on the same uh, step. Um, I'm now going to, according to this agenda, ask Chirofacho uh, uh, if you would uh, do your last uh, hooray for us. Um, and then I will ask uh, Professor Mutata thereafter to close. Let us sing a new song, one that is written in our own image in a tune that we can all dance to. Let us sing a new song, one that is written in our own image in a tune that we can all dance to. Let us read with understanding the lyrics, breathe in thoughts complimentary. Let us sing a new song, one that is written in our own image in a tune that we can all dance to. Deep in our diaphragms, up our throats, we begin to sing a new song, one that began deep, deep, deep within our bellies. Before our ears could even realize the song has been there, the song has been here beating. At the pace of our heartbeats, the adrenaline released from the fear of Eurocentric ways of knowing, the adrenaline released from the fear of Afrocentric ways of knowing has been the muse for a new song.
listen. For in the listening, you will begin to hear more than just the beautiful merging of pedagogies. In the listening, you will begin to hear the transcendence of the national anthem. From the somber hymn of colonization, from the somber hymn, hymn of a culturedness, the new song is sung by a new choir. One that is unique to its own true new culture. The song is sung with its own unique future, written in our own image, in a tune that we can all dance to. Deep within our hearts, the motive is there. The zeal is there, the will is there. Let us grab it from our hearts and begin to barge with a new song. Let us barge with a new song. Let us barge with a new song. we could uh, prolong the night. We'll just simply say the chava <laughs> midit. Um, thank you very much, Chiro uh, Facho. Um, to know that we almost didn't have you grace this occasion and for you to deliver such a wonderful performance. Thank you and thank you. I'm now going to ask the registrar, Professor Stewart Mutata, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, thank you, program director. When I was told that Professor Musala was coming here, I told my wife before I came here, I said, let me eat, because uh, if Musala is there, it's, we, we're not going to come back now. <laughs> having, having listened to Prof. Masala for, for many, many years in political gatherings and so forth, it became even worse when I saw um, Dr. Mshibudi Manyana come here and said, we are in for it today. <laughs> so, but thank, thank you very much. Bachach, you have been with us for 14 years, uh, 14 lectures. You have been coming here. You were not selfish. And I think it's time for us, uh, through your program director, to ask the audience to stand and give Bakara a big round of applause. For this. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, is it Komar Impasel? And I, I know your brother. I went with your brother to, I think it's your brother, to a tough group. Um, you took some of my, my ideas here. Because I was going to ask the program director that um, we, we know, or we, some of us, at least know, where, who Eski Impasel is. But where does he come from? What you just said here, Dr. Mbachele, about you know, apologies and so forth, we need that simplified family tree of Dr. Of, um, Eski Mbachele. Maybe in the next lecture, there will be another 14 years, I guess, and more. Uh, maybe the next one, we can have a sense of where Dr. Eski Mbachele, I mean, uh, Professor Eski Mbachele comes from. Um, so thank, thank you very much for the program director. Uh, even after some 14 years, after his passing, we still invoke his memory through gatherings of, uh, of this nature. 
while we cannot touch you, he can touch us through down Second Avenue. And I know, uh, Professor uh, Masala, you love down Second Avenue. I'm sure some of us, you know, wrote that book. We cannot touch him now, but he's busy touching us through down Second Avenue and some of the articles and some of the books that uh, Dr. Nkomani Pachene, you know, informed us about. And for that, Bahar, we, we are really, really, and we will ever, forever be grateful, you know, about this. We may not be here in the next 14 years, you know, some of us, but let's continue. It will be good to, to, to get the younger generation coming, you know, joining us as we continue to be here every year, you know, to remember Dr. Uh, Professor Eskia um, Pachele. Allow me, Program Director, to thank his parents for having delivered his son into the Pachele family way back in 1919. And their grooming and parental qualities nurtured a legend of note and a father to the nation. Professor Mulugu, uh, Professor Mulugu supporter, um, our gratitude flows your way for setting the tone to this evening with your introductory remarks. And we must also appreciate you for keeping this important lecture alive on the university calendar. And for that, Prof. Mulugu, we really, really appreciate it. And we'll show, we are very sure that uh, we will continue to roll this forward. And of course, to you and, um, and your, your colleagues in the Northeastern uh, Regional Directorate, Reale Lavo. The welcome address and introduction of the guest speaker was very ably delivered by our own principal and vice chancellor, Professor Pude Lenkabula. As you would have expected, Professor Lenkabula's address, as always, is inspiring. She also ensured that the guest speaker was introduced fully and properly, underlying the impact that he has had and continues to have in our life as a nation. And we really thank you, um, Prof. Lingabula. Professor Musala, thank you very much, sir. I've listened to you so many times, um, so many times. I don't know how many, but so many times. I, I did listen to you. And Prof. Musala, thank you for finding the ways to unpack what would have otherwise have been a complex concept. So when you came here and talked about uh, black intellectualism and about uh, the missing variable, and I was like, where is the variable here? You know, but I guess lecture with ease and we're really
stomach, but the very moment we started with the first item, you made me feel real comfortable. Um, and if I made mistakes somewhere, um, I, was, I, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I think we, we pretty much had a great uh, <laughs> evening. So, um, Bahar, thank you very much for being available and for gracing this uh, occasion ever so diligently all the time when we asked you. I'm not going to stand between you and uh, belated dinner. However, I just want to make the following announcements. I've been asked to communicate this, that um, we have got two savings points. Um, the two tables, um, unfortunately, they are not numbered, and it's not our culture to point people with, uh, with you. No. But the table that uh, the Vice Chancellor and Principal is sitting in, as well as the one that uh, the Registrar and uh, the Vice Principal are sitting on, should have been asked must proceed to that um, saving point. And that, after that, all those people sitting in this side of the hall must proceed and follow and have their meal that side. And by the same token, the colleagues who are seated beside, that's the saving point, that side. Otherwise, have a wonderful meal and drive safely home. All the best to you. Until we meet next year, all the best. Bye-bye. <laughs>